Welcome back everyone, it's Eric from Rare Candy here today on the channel. I'm going to be giving my tournament report for the recent regional I got to go attend in Toronto. You know, at the time of filming, I literally just got back uh, yesterday and I wanted to kind of go over everything while the whole experience was still fresh in my mind. Going to be going over, you know, my deck list, my matchups, you know, kind of the metagame I expected to see prior to the event, all that type of stuff. So let's dig into it. I'll tell you how my regional run went. So for this regional, this was going to be, I believe, actually the very first expanded regional featuring the new set Team Up. And this is actually expanded format. So that means there are going to be cards all the way back from black and white all the way up to uh, the most recent set Team Up that were going to be illegal for play. So pretty big card pool uh, that we have here. You know, Team Up, of course, was going to introduce, I think, Pikachu Zekrom as a potential a uh, major contender into the metagame. But outside of that, we did also have some recent bans effect expanded. We saw Lusamine, Delinquent, and Maxi's Hidden Ball Trick all exit the format. So between, you know, a couple of these cards leaving and this new set and this new archetype being injected into the mix, this did look to be maybe kind of a fresh regional. I was actually really looking forward to this just because, you know, I was actually personally really excited about the bands in particular more so than team up. You know, a lot of my problems and expanded previously just came from the amount of toxicity that exists in the in the game or in that format since there's so many like degenerative combos that some of these cards enabled. So I was really looking forward to actually playing uh, in this new format. So really outside of injecting Pikachu Zekrom into the mix though, I really didn't expect Expand to be shaken up that much. Uh, you know, a couple of the control variants took a hit and I basically just expected fewer control decks, mainly like the Waylord Mill deck and even like the Zorart control variant. I expected those to kind of see a decline in popularity, but by and large, I think a lot of the major archetypes that were previously in Expanded uh, were still gonna be very powerful. Uh, going into this event. So that means Zorark, of course, going to be very, very strong. Buzzwell GX, uh, in particular, looked to get a bit of a boost since Pikachu Zekrom actually was one of the most hyped decks going into this event. Uh, you know, it proved to not really deliver on that front, but nevertheless, fighting was very, very hyped, you know, going into this event. We even saw some people hyping the, like, Hitmonchan uh, Wobbuffet deck a little bit. That seemed like maybe uh, one, like a potential rogue type of deck that uh, could have seen play and actually did do, you know, it had a decent showing at this event, I will say. Uh, but then a lot of other kind of contenders we expect to still see play like Archie's, Vespaquin, uh, Rayquaza, which actually didn't really have a great showing at this event, despite getting some actually really good new tools from, uh, from Team Up. Um, but like I said, by and large, I kind of expected a lot of things to remain fairly the same outside of seeing control decks kind of uh, take a backseat for this regional. So taking all of this into account, that kind of shaped, you know, my potential deck choice for this event. And I knew there was a couple of decks in particular that I could always fall back on in expanded format. Drampa Garb has been probably my favorite deck in the expanded format for a while now. I played it, I think, at literally every expanded event I went to last season and always did pretty well with it. I won several League Cups with it, uh, you know, did pretty well actually recently at Dallas Regionals with it as well. I knew it was a comfortable deck for me to play. I thought the deck was still good going into this event. Sedgwick GX is a fantastic attacker against the new uh, Pikachu Zekrom. So the deck even has outs against that new archetype. And also, I think, just holds up very well against most of the other established decks as well. So I knew that was kind of my backup deck no matter what. If I couldn't find anything else I liked, I was just going to sleeve it up. Probably actually my same 60 from Dallas and just play that. Just because the deck really didn't gain or lose too much from uh, Team Up and the bands being introduced. The next deck I began kind of taking a look at was Rayquaza GX. So as you guys might know, I'm kind of a big Rayquaza GX fan. It took me to Top 8 Worlds uh, this past season. So it definitely has a bit of a soft spot in my heart, especially in Expanded where we do have a lot of those older tools that made Rayquaza so good in the Worlds format, like Max Elixirs uh, as probably the best example. Uh, but Rayquaza did gain some new tools from the new team up set. Uh, like Shaman Prism Star, Tapu Koko Prism Star. And even though it is kind of similar in playstyle to the Pikachu Zekrom deck, you know, Pikachu Zekrom had a lot of hype around it and was going to be, you know, targeted down very aggressively. Uh, you know, we saw people talking about the Hitmonchan Wobbuffet deck. We saw people hyping Buzzcario, even like Zoroark, uh, Lucario, and stuff like that. So there was a lot of fighting hype around this event. And Rayquaza, even though it's similar to Pikachu Zekrom in terms of how it plays, it doesn't have the same weakness and it only gives up two prizes as well, which is pretty nice. So I felt that 
if you wanted to play kind of one of these big energy accelerating max elixir based decks, Rayquaza seemed like a pretty strong play given that it didn't have the same target on it that Peach of Zekrom did. Also, I just really think that Rayquaza GX, especially the Parallel City heavy version of the deck, I think has a lot of tools to deal with a lot of decks in the metagame, whereas the Skyfield version does not. So that was a version I was actually really testing for a little bit and was another one of my kind of front runners. But despite both these decks being pretty safe picks for me, I'm pretty comfortable with both of them at this point. One thing I actually really wanted to get back to trying out are decks based around double dragon energy. I know that's like weirdly specific, but since the bans went into effect and the control decks were going to take a hit and probably not see a whole lot of play, that actually makes decks that are reliant on double dragon energy and similarly decks that just play 4 DCE like Night March and Vespaquin just has an example. I think those decks do see a potential uptick in uh, viability just because you're not going to hit as many decks that are able to just like endlessly fob a loop you and run you out of energy. So that led me to testing actually a variety of different dragon decks and one that actually kind of caught my attention pretty early on was the new Alolan Executor from Team Up. You know I remember one night on PTCGO I was like you know I'm gonna trade for some of these Alolan Executors we're gonna just get in uh, you know a couple games with this deck have some fun but after playing around with it, I actually became more and more impressed with it the more games I got in with it. And this deck actually started out as kind of just like a meme that I was going to, like I said, play a couple fun games with on PTCGO, but actually ended up really catching my eye. And the closer I got to the tournament, the more I actually wanted to play this. You know, we have the Propagation Execute and Expanded. We have Double Dragon Energy. We have things like Lance. We, we have Ditto Prism Star. This card has a lot of support, and it really started to impress me, like I said, the more I got in games with it. And ultimately, I decided to play Alone Executor. I had a buddy of mine uh, who also I sent the list to. He was getting kind of excited about it, so we, were, we both kind of agreed, you know what? We're going to play this deck. It's pretty good, and it would be just a, a blast to play. The deck itself is actually a pretty fun archetype. So probably a week before the tournament, I kind of mentally committed to playing this thing, and from there on, uh, Alone Executor became my front runner. And, of course, as you can tell by the thumbnail and title of this video, it is the deck that I ultimately did decide on. So let's take a look at my list and see what I actually used to play at this event. So this is the list that I did ultimately decide on for Toronto Regionals for this Alolan Executor deck. And just a quick plug too, this was actually featured in an article I posted exclusively for our Stage 2 patrons and higher over at patreon.com slash rarecandytcg. I think the list I posted was literally one, maybe two cards at most different from this, but our patrons did have you know early knowledge of this deck uh, leading up to the event. There's even another dragon deck in that same article, so if you guys are interested in maybe playing around with some double dragon energy based decks, uh, I will have a link down below in the description if you guys want to learn about how to support our channel and also get some cool exclusive content in the process. Uh, but anyways, let's get back to the actual list here that we're taking a look at. Lone Executor, the whole deck is based around this card. It has this attack egg splat for a grass and colorless, or just a single double dragon energy. You discard any number of execute from your hand, and it does 60 for each one you discard in this way. So of course in Expanded, we have double dragon energy to use this for a single attachment. We have execute with the propagation ability. If it's in your discard pile, you may return it to your hand. So you guys can easily see the synergy here. You propagate all of your eggs back into your hand and discard them every turn to do large amounts of damage, usually around 180 to 240 if you can even get all four eggs in your hand, which is uh, you know, not actually not too uncommon with this deck. But uh, let's go over a couple of other key cards in here that really makes the deck work. Ditto Prism Star is going to be a big one because you can actually discard all four eggs, since Ditto is actually what you use to evolve into a lone executor and not execute, so that allows you to keep your damage output pretty high. But there's another card in particular in the expanded format that really makes this deck tick, and that is going to be the Ditto all the way back from Boundaries Crossed. So this is a card kind of, I think, long and forgotten about at this point, but has this ability transform once during your turn before you attack. You may put a base Pokemon from your hand on top of this Pokemon, and this does not count as playing that Pokemon or evolving. And now this Pokemon is now that Pokemon. And any cards attached to it, damage counters, etc. still remain. So the reason this card is so important is because it allows you... Well, the, the big issue with the deck is you always want two Executors in play. But if you have two Executors in play, that limits your damage output. Because you need as many eggs in your hand at the same time. 
uh, to use egg splat for large amounts of damage. So this ditto is really nice because you can have your Alolan Executor in the active spot, ideally evolved from a ditto Prism Star or maybe from a Lance Prism Star. And then you have this ditto sitting on your bench. And so what you can do is you attack with this, your current Executor, and when it gets knocked out, you transform ditto into an execute and then you can immediately evolve into executor since it's already been in play so it allows you to set up an executor in one turn while also still allowing you to maximize your damage output with your your current one so this card is very important i think this is one reason this deck is so good is because of this old ditto that we have then the other interesting thing kind of about this list is the inclusion of a variety of different like counter energy based attackers here uh, so most notably Suda Widow from Breakpoint and Shaman from Shining Legends. So this is just to cover some different matchups and give us a better chance against against them. So Suda Widow, fantastic against things like Picaram and also Zor Arc variants with that watch, watch and learn attack. Uh, so just for a counter energy or for a counter energy and rainbow energy, you can uh, copy one of your opponent's attacks, but you're fighting, so you hit for weakness on things like Picaram, like I said, or uh, Zor Arc variants, being able to take one shots. Uh, and potentially like three prize knockouts with just this one prize little pseudo that we have here. Similarly, Shaman is going to be great for things like Archies because with a counter energy and a choice band, you can actually knock out a fully powered uh, Magikarp Waylord GX. And also, these are going to be good attackers against matchups where your opponent has access to ability lock. So if they're playing something like an Alolan Muck, this is... These are potential ways you can get around that to knock out the Muck, or if you're going against a Guard Boater deck, same type of thing, or Wobbuffet even. So these are to kind of give us some coverage against some of these archetypes that might give us some problems at certain times. A lot of the other stuff in the deck is going to be pretty standard stuff, Ultra Balls versus Seekers. Uh, we do have the one copy of Faba, which is going to be good to be able to continuously remove tools from Garbatox and Garboters. Uh, we have the Lance Prism Star to get out two more alone Executors without having to evolve. It's going to be another key card here. Teammates, very good with one prize decks like this. Um, but everything else, like I said, I think is going to be relatively straightforward. And actually, I have to do say, I am really proud of this deck list. Even after Toronto Regionals, I probably wouldn't actually change a single card here. Uh, going forward, I'm not sure if I will play this archetype for like Greensboro Regionals, which is coming up this coming weekend at the time of filming, and I'll get more into that later uh, in this tournament report why that is. But nevertheless, I do really like this list, and I had to, if I had to play this all over again, I definitely would. Really happy with all of my card choices for this event. So let's get into my matchups, and I'll take you through how my tournament run went. So round one for my day, I get paired against a Sokaleo GX Lunala GX Talonflame deck, from what I recall. So they had, uh, I remember they had the Sokaleo, of course, to get out all of their energy with Soulburst GX, they had Lunala's, and they played like the unit energies that are, that cover the metal and psychic ones, so they could move them around with Lunala's whenever they want to. And I'm assuming Max Potion, I never saw any Max Potions from my opponent in either game that we played, but if they're playing the Lunala GX, I have to assume that's probably what they were going to be going for, that way they could move the energy, you know, use Max Potion, then move it back onto the Solgaleos or something like that. That's my best guess at least. Uh, game one, I remember my opponent really didn't have the best start. I think I Marsh Shattered them, and they just didn't have much after that, and I was able to uh, pretty decidedly take that game. Game two was a little bit closer, but nevertheless, uh, Executor just trades really, really well against these GX heavy decks. Being able to take one-hit knockouts with a one-prize attacker that also has 160 HP is just really, really nice. So, uh Round one, I took pretty convincingly, and it felt really good to start off the day at 1-0, especially with kind of a weird deck like this that doesn't have like any hype going into this event. Uh, it is sometimes a little nerve-wracking to sleeve up these kind of rogue picks uh, when you're not really sure how they're going to do. Um, but I felt pretty good. Like I said, I like the deck list I ended up settling on, and uh, starting off the day with the win felt good. So round two, I got paired against an Archie deck, and at the beginning of the round, though, I got called over to like the uh, judge area over the intercom, and I found out my deck list wasn't properly submitted. <laughs> so if you guys know what happened to me at Roanoke Regionals um, this past fall, this won't sound like a surprise to anyone. I had some deck list issues at that event as well. And uh, yeah, I'm just really bad at actually properly submitting my deck list, apparently. 
So I saved it on um, Arcanine Labs, which is like the online like deck list uh, submission site that we use for these events, but I never actually finished submitting it though. So as a result, I did get deck checked and I was given a game loss for the second round, which felt bad. But I was happy I didn't get like DQ'd or anything like that. I just really wanted to play this deck. So, um, you know, taking the game loss, I was I felt like that was perfectly reasonable. Uh, but basically forces me to win two games, which actually can be a challenge. Some of these, one, especially if I go against like a one prize attacking deck, actually playing two full games with a lone executor can take a while. Uh, but luckily I did get paired against an Archie deck here. And I actually, I remember in game two, uh, technically the first game we played of the series since I got that game loss in game one, I searched my deck and I realized my Shaman and my Mr. Mime are both prized, which is... Kind of how I'm going to beat this matchup. Towering Splash GX is just an insane move against this deck. They can wipe out your whole bench. So prizing Mr. Mime is really, really bad. Also, of course, I mean, that's going to be the big card that you really don't want prized. But having Shaman prized on top of that felt even worse just because that basically meant I can never one-shot a Magikarp Waylord. But one thing that did happen in our game two, my opponent did draw too many cards off of a Shaman, and he was given a prize penalty that allowed me to pretty, I think, convincingly take game two. So I basically had to take fewer prizes than normally necessary in order to win. And we went on to a game three. And I had to say, I was actually really worried I was going to lose this because my opponent had an insane turn one. They got the turn one Archies. They had like seven energy on their Magikarp Waylord. Uh, at the same time and it was just really felt bad because after their insane first turn I searched my deck and yet again Mr. Mime and Shaman are both prized uh, but luckily my opponent burned their towering splash GX fairly early on to knock out my ditto prism star and then from there I was actually able to pretty effectively trade knockouts with these Magikarp Waylords because let's just run through it Magikarp Waylord is going to knock you out they're going to take one prize uh, per attack but then per every two attacks of uh, my deck, I take three. So I'm always one prize ahead in the exchange, and I was able to knock out two of these to win game two. So I was really worried about how this whole round started out with my game loss, my bad prizes, but nevertheless, Lowen Executor was able to pull off the win here. Round three, I end up facing a Buzz Garb deck, and this is another matchup I'm ecstatic to see just because uh, the deck really can't put on a whole lot of early game pressure. Sometimes they can, uh, you know, take an, a quick knockout on a Ditto on their first turn if they have like the Buzzwell and a Guzma uh, or something like that. But generally speaking, I think my deck is most certainly favored here. I can set up very quickly without committing a whole lot of items. Uh, to the discard pile. Even if my opponent gets a Garbatoxin up very quickly, we always have the Paradise Draw attack on Executor to draw out of a dead hand. Uh, we play Faba and the two Field Blowers. So Garbatoxin really isn't even like a huge annoyance here. Uh, so game one, I won very, very convincingly. Game two, however, things were a little bit different. I end up prizing, I believe, two Executes in this matchup, which is actually really bad because Buzzwell has 130 HP. And prizing two executes means we can never take a one shot on a buzzwell. But nevertheless, I was still trading pretty well with my opponent. I still felt pretty much fine. But at one point, my opponent does establish the Garbatoxin and gets the uh, ability lock going. And I remember I did misplay really terribly. And this is what cost me the series and basically forced a tie. Because game one took forever just because we were both single prize decks. And it takes a long time to actually take all six prizes when you're just taking one knockout at a time. And I remember I had like a play where I had an active alone executor and I had a field blower in hand and I could blower and attack the active uh, trash wrench garbota for 60, which felt really bad. And I remember initially on my turn, I was going to just use paradise draw, let my opponent knock me out and then use Lance on my next turn to get two executors into play. Uh, my current executor would be knocked out, putting an egg in the discard pile, and then I could use Blower to discard the Floatstone and knock out the active Trash Winch Garboder. I remember that was my initial plan. I think my turn just kind of went on for a while, and I forgot my like initial plan that I was going for, and I ended up just like field blowing the tool and just hitting for 60, which was absolutely 1,000% a misplay. I realized it immediately once I did it. I was like, oh wait, I was going to do you know this, this, and this on my next turn instead and that really did cost me the game after that they just threw down another tool continued to attack with the 
uh, Trash Lanch Carboder, and I was just drawing dead from there at that point. So I really messed up just absolutely massively. My opponent didn't have another Trash Lanch Carboder in play, and that was really the only threat, and I really messed up t not taking that thing out properly. And as a result, my opponent was able to force, uh, you know, a Game 3, and Game 3 we had nowhere near enough time to complete. I think time got called on, like, the second turn of the game or something like that. And uh, we went to a tie, which felt really bad because this was a matchup I definitely was prepared to win. And uh, I have no one else to blame but myself. I definitely let that one slip through my fingers there. So nevertheless, still starting out 2-0-1. Feels okay, but it, it always feels bad for uh, you know a good matchup to be forced to a tie or a loss even. And unfortunately, we have kind of a similar story in round 4. I get paired against a Vespaquin deck. I have to say our game one was actually very, very close. It did take a good while to complete, but I did prize my Oracorio, and I basically had to hit it at some point, and if I did, I was just going to win. And luckily, I think it was my third prize I took, or maybe it was my fourth. I think it was my fourth prize. And had I not drawn that, I probably would have lost, but I finally found the Oracorio, and I was able to you know, clean up game one and take that one for my own. Game two, I searched my deck, Oracorio's in my deck, I had my eggs in my deck too, and really it looked like I was going to be in a good spot to take this one as long as I set up kind of, kind of normally. Uh, I will say this, there was, I remember one turn in particular, all I needed to hit was an energy to take a knockout on a Vespaquin, I played a supporter, and then I played two Mars Shadows, and still with the energy I needed to take a knockout. So that was one of the key things that went wrong in this matchup. But another thing I did, I think that might have been a subtle misplay. I used my Oracorio very early on to take a knockout on my opponent's bench. And had I not taken the knockout with the Oracorio, I wouldn't have been able to take a knockout at all. So that was why I used my Oracorio very early on. And of course, I knew it was probably going to get returned KO'd, but my stretcher was in deck. So I knew I could always just reuse it again whenever I needed to. But the issue was I could never actually find my stretcher throughout the course of the rest of this game, which basically forced me to just kind of exchange knockouts normally. And me whiffing that one knockout on that Vespaquin that one turn kind of put me on the prize behind my opponent. Uh, but game two, time did get called. And basically, I need to either find Oracorio on my last turn of time, or I need to prevent my opponent from taking a knockout on myself. So unfortunately, I was not able to find my Oracorio, but I still had an out at my disposal. I was able to take a knockout on a Vespa Quinn and end us both to one at that point. And basically, my opponent had one last turn uh, remaining, and they had to win on this turn. Otherwise, game two would not complete, and I would win the series. So off the end of one, my opponent uses a Rengar to instruct, and they play an end of their own. And I'm thinking... We got there. You know, we we are good to go at this point. My opponent just gets a single card off this. They've already used Instruct. We are good. They need a Vespa Queen still. They need a DCE still. And they literally can't get that off an end of one. And so we both cut each other's decks. My opponent draws, and he gets a Shaman EX. And he's able to draw the rest of his deck and find the energy and Vespa Queen needed to take a knockout and force game three, which obviously doesn't even begin to start. And so my opponent steals kind of a unfortunate game to enforces another tie. And this is another matchup that I am fully expecting to beat. This is a good matchup. I play the Oracorio. Executor trades well with Vespaquin just already in general. But with the Oracorio, it's usually a, you know, a very, very favorable matchup. But unfortunately, things did not really go that way in that game. So next round, I get paired against Shock Clock, which immediately broke my heart whenever my opponent flipped over a Lily Pup. So one of the reasons I chose a low-end Executor is because I did expect a drop in the amount of players playing control-style decks because of things like the recent bans like Lusamine and uh, Delinquent, just as an example. So I felt like the odds of me actually hitting some sort of control variant were like super low for this event. So the fact that I got paired against one of the only ones, uh, maybe even the only shock lock in the room, I'm not sure how many people actually played this deck. It was not a very popular one, but nevertheless, I did run into it and this is just pretty bad. Uh, you know, they try to just infinitely paralyze you with Raichu basically until you deck out. Uh, they can also endlessly Faba loop you and just run you of energy. I believe he played in a low-end muck line as well. So I, I literally had just like nothing to, to do against this deck. I will say this though, in game one, uh, he prized, I think, some, some ways to actually recycle his Raichu lock. And had I been able to actually take one hit knockouts, I think I actually would have been in a pretty good situation to, to even win game one. 
uh, but I prized two eggs and I started one, so I could only have access to 60 damage basically for the whole game. They're not going to be taking prizes, so the active egg would never be in the discard uh, throughout the course of a game. And it's just kind of kind of heartbreaking because if the other two eggs weren't prized, like I said, I actually do think I was in a good position uh, to win just because my opponent did prize some crucial things. He prized his Gladion as well, so he couldn't even you know, effectively fish out what he wanted out of his prizes either. So that is a little bit unfortunate. I, th I do think I could have stolen a game one, and then from there, these games take so long to complete. I think I could have just... Uh, we could have had a game two never even complete, and I could have won the series even. Um, but like I said, things didn't quite go that way. Uh, game one, he eventually got the lock up and running. Like I said, my damage output was just so low. I have to three-shot these stout ones, and that just gives him too much time to actually uh, you know, get his lock up and running. So I scoop game one in hopes of maybe having uh, a game two where I can just like Marsh shadow him first turn and maybe just shut him out of the game that way. And off both Marsh shadows, I used neither one really stuck. He always had a response and he got his lock up, you know, much faster actually even than in game one uh, since he didn't prize some of some of his important cards as well. So I just scooped after a few turns just because I know how this goes. Uh, I'm just going to eventually lose this one. I don't really have any outs to these types of decks. Uh, you're basically just hoping you don't hit them just because of how unpopular they normally are. So unfortunately, I did take my first loss of the day after starting out pretty hot. Well, I shouldn't say hot, but after starting out well 2-0, um, you know, my luck has just kind of been going down. I had a couple of those ties get forced on me uh, when I sh those are matchups I should win. I did hit an auto loss, but you know what? It's okay. You're bound to hit a bad matchup at some point in the nine round events. So, uh, you know, it happens. As long as I just keep getting paired against like normal decks, I feel like I have a good shot at still making day two. I do need to win all of my next four rounds. But like I said, as long as I get paired up against kind of like a normal deck, like a, you know, like an Archie's deck or a Rayquaza, a Picarom, etc. I'm pretty confident I can take those matches. Just have to keep dodging these control decks. So next up, I get paired against a Buzzwell Lucario deck. I was ecstatic to see this. Now, uh, you know, Buzzwell actually can potentially put on some very oppressive early game pressure since uh, both dittos are going to be weak to fighting. Execute only has 30 HP. Uh, but nevertheless, if I can survive like literally the first turn or so, then my deck is in a great position to uh, deal with theirs. You know, I play multiple field blowers so I can get rid of focus sashes, play the Faba as well. And it's just very easy to trade well with these big uh, basic and stage one GX heavy decks like these. So this was a fantastic match by Felt. Uh, game one, I did end up taking. I do believe my opponent actually may have gotten a prize penalty in this in this game one as well, if I remember correctly. Either way, I was in a pretty good spot, even as far as like board state goes, and game one kind of went my way. Game two, however, I was not quite as fortunate. If I remember correctly, I did prize an egg or two, and my opponent did field blower away one of my choice bands at a crucial moment, which prevented me from ever being able to take one hit knockouts. I think maybe I may have prized a choice band, they field blowered one, and then after one executor went down, I didn't have another one to uh, kind of clean up with. So uh, the big downside of not being able to one-shot Pokemon in this matchup is that they are very reliant on things like Acerolas, and there's a good chance they can always deny knockouts if I don't take a one-hit knockout on them. So being able to, you know, normally against these GX decks, if you have to two-shot them, you still trade very well. But in this case, you actually get punished for it because they can just Acerola up all the damage. And game two really didn't go my way. So I lose game two, and then we start shuffling up for game three here. And I do have to admit, I do still feel pretty good about this. Now, the only thing is that, again, playing a one prize attacker deck like this, your games do go on a little bit longer than with a lot of other decks because your opponent has to take six knockouts, which does extend the length of a game as opposed to just playing uh, a bunch of GXs. So at this point, we've already used up a ton of our time. And very early on in the series, I told my opponent, you know, hey, if it looks like it's going to go to a tie, you know, if you're ahead at the end of this, I'm just going to give you, uh, I'm just going to give you the series because there's no point in either of us time because at this point in the day, neither of us can take a loss because we won't be able to make day two. So there's no point in this game going to a tie. So I told my opponent, you know, if this does look like in a game three, you're going to win. I'm just going to give you the win uh, just, just to prevent that type of situation from happening. So we get a few turns in, and even though my deck is kind of working, I had to Sycamore away three versus Seekers by turn two, and I prized to Execute. And it was pretty bad, pretty bad from that point. Now, 
My opponent did take a knockout and I was able to Lance and I actually had four alone executors in play on like my third turn of the game, which was really nice. But then I played an N afterwards and halfway through a shuffling, I realized, oh wait, I played Lance already this turn. And now I've played a second supporter and my hand got shuffled into my deck. So this is pretty bad. This is almost always a game loss just because you can't really um, reverse the game state at this point. So we called over a judge, but like I said, I kind of anticipated a game loss at this point uh, just because that's typically the outcome that happens. And to no surprise, I got a game loss. So, so that feels really bad. I basically knocked myself out of day two here, which was really, really unfortunate. And to no less, to a good matchup too. This is exactly the type of matchup I want to hit with a lone executor. You know, even with prizing two eggs, it's still not the end of the world because you can still Guzma and Lysander, things like Octillery and Diancy, and some of these like low HP basics, like even just a Riolu. And I can dig eggs out of the prizes and still come back and win. I'm pretty confident about that. But the issue was, of course, having enough time to actually get the game to that type of state uh, before time gets called. And of course, it doesn't. It ultimately doesn't matter since I shuffled my hand into my deck. So this is kind of a, a bummer to get knocked out of day two just due to my own kind of like misplay. We were both playing, I think, a little fast, just trying to make sure that we could try to finish the game, uh, you know, before time gets called. So I think I was just rushing a bit and uh, kind of lost track of you know what I had already done on my turn. So kind of a bummer, guys, that I'm out of day two at this point. But it's still not the end of the world if I win my next three games. I can still make top 64 and still get some championship points, which is ultimately why I showed up to the event. Um, it, it does hurt a little bit not to be able to say, hey, I made day two with uh, this crazy alone executor deck. But, uh, but nevertheless, I'm going to press on and see if we can at least make top 64. Next round, I get paired against Drampa Garboder. So this is actually a matchup that is a little more unfavorable than some of the other matchups that I've had thus far. You know, I play two Field Blower and I play a Faba, so I still have outs to beating this deck. And even in my testing, it's been like fairly 50-50-ish. You know, sometimes if they just hit you with the lock at the right time, like the parallel Garboder, like end of two or three or one even, sometimes that can shut you out. But generally speaking, my deck plays enough outs to deal with this, this matchup. And uh, game one, my opponent did get a prize penalty. I forget exactly what happened. Oh, yeah, I remember what it was. They benched an Oracorio under, uh, while I had the Roadblock Suda Widow out, and then they shuffled their hand with, like, an N or something like that, and, uh, you know, they wouldn't have been able to bench it. They'd already drawn a new hand, and they got a prize penalty for that, and that did help me win Game 1. So that felt really good, especially because Game 1 did go on for a while, as I've kind of said. Uh, your matchups with these one prize decks tend to drag on a little bit sometimes. And even in Game 2... Really close game, but I ultimately pulled it out there, taking a win over Drampa Garbo. Definitely felt good. You know, my luck was definitely on the decline ever since round three. And it felt good to finally get another win after literally just some terrible bad luck at this regional. So felt good to, to beat a Garboder deck. And that kind of made me feel a little bit better because that is one of the six downfalls is going to be ability lock. So whenever you can take a win against a deck that is heavy on ability lock, it kind of, you know, reaffirms your deck choice a little bit, I think. However, next round, I do get paired against a Donphan, Hitmonchan, Wobbuffet deck. So it wasn't like straight Hitmonchan. It wasn't Donphan. He played kind of a split of both of them. Of course, Donphan has uh, that resistance to uh, lightning, which is kind of nice. And also, it hits for a little bit more damage than the Hitmonchan as well. But very much so, it was still largely the same type of archetype that saw a little bit of hype coming into this regional and my heart kind of sank at this point just because I know this is going to be a tough matchup. Uh, having Wobbuffet up every turn is really, really bad for my deck because I can't propagate, which means I can't take knockouts with Executor very reliably. Having said that, I do play Lysander, do play Guzma, so I can always Guzma up something on the bench, then use Propagate and, you know, take knockouts that way. But nevertheless, it is definitely a pain against this deck. However, I actually was able to pull out a win against this deck, to, even to my surprise. Uh, my opponent had to, I think they attached two float stones from their hand on their first turn before playing a Juniper, I think it was. So they had to burn some float stones pretty early on, uh, on non Wobbuffet Pokemon specifically. I think he had a float stone on a Hitmonchan and a Diancy, if I remember correctly here. 
So that's already two float zones down on Pokemon you don't want them on. Uh, so from there, he only had access to two more throughout the course of a game. And being able to just feel blower those off really kind of put him in an odd spot. And I was able to do a play basically where I locked his Wobbuffet or really anything at that point in the active. And I used Oracorio to just spread around and take knockouts that way. And because my opponent didn't have access to their float stones, they weren't able to reliably use spinning turn or the uh, attack on Hitmonchan, I forget what it's called off the top of my head. And uh, I was able to kind of win in, in a weird, unconventional way. And so really pumped about that. <laughs> I was really worried that this was going to be my third loss at this point, but I was able to, to make it happen. And uh, so, yeah, we're still in it for top 64. Just one more win to go, and then we're going to get there. Then going into round nine, my opponent flips over a Jirachi EX, and that kind of caught me off guard. It's not really a card you see too often because most decks are going to play Tapu Lele since it's you know 170 HP GX. Uh, it's also Psychic type, can attack uh, with Energy Drive as well. So yeah, you don't see Jirachi too often. So that made me think this has to be a deck that plays Hoopa EX, which means this can probably only be like Mega Gardevoir or maybe like Turbo Dark or something like that. And it was Mega Gardevoir EX, specifically the Despair Ray one. And I'd say this is, I think, a pretty good matchup uh, just because my deck can trade very, very well against these basic EX GXs in Stage 1 or Mega uh, EXs in this case. Now, the one scary thing about this matchup is that my opponent played four of the Giratinas from Lost Thunder. And that's actually really scary because they can get them out of the discard every turn, put three to four damage counters in play, and then discard them again with the spare ray. So if I ever get my uh, Ditto from Boundaries Cross down on the bench and haven't transformed it and evolved into Executor yet, if they ever put three damage counters on it, I can't actually transform into Execute because it would then be knocked out. So there is definitely a world where my opponent can... Uh, you know, kind of put me in a weird spot and potentially take a game, especially because they play all sorts of healing cards like Max Potions. And if I'm ever not able to one-shot a Gardevoir, they can probably trade pretty well with my deck. But if I can successfully get a couple Executors up and running, I feel pretty good because I can just one-shot these, these uh, Mega Gardevoirs. And game one, especially, my opponent had a little bit of an awkward spot, and I was able to get the Roadblock Sudowoodo up and prevent my opponent from ever getting a second Gardevoir uh, down in play. And I remember my opponent had like a Giratina active and their singular Mega Gardevoir on bench. And I had an alone Executor. And I basically just like passed until my opponent was able to... Well, actually, I didn't pass. I just kept using Paradise Draw or whatever the first attack on Executor is. Until my opponent got out of the active spot on their own and took Knockout. And the reason for that is I did not want to knock out the Giratina because they could always bench their next Gardevoir. And I wanted to, whenever I take a Knockout, I want my opponent to not have another Pokemon to be able to respond with. So I did not mind waiting for my opponent to find Guzma uh, because then I can take two prizes in response and they won't have a GX, or I'm sorry, Mega Gardevoir EX on the next turn to actually attack with. So that was kind of my strategy. Paid off pretty well. I won game one very convincingly. And game one took up most of our time and game two actually didn't even complete. I think we got about like three quarters of the way through and then time got called and I ended up winning the series. So I was able to actually win out at this tournament, which felt pretty good. Uh, you know, after the middle of my day where my luck really, really went south, uh, it felt good to at least end the tournament on a good note. Unfortunately, I did not make day two. You had to have 19 match points or greater in order to make day two. And here I only had 17 match points, but still this did secure me top 64 points. So that's going to get me a little bit closer to Worlds. I got some packs in the process too. So even still, I had a pretty good day overall. It would have been great, like I said, to make it a day two with such a wild deck. It's always uh, That's always kind of the allure of playing these rogue decks too, is you always want to be that guy that uh, when people look at like the standings, they're like, what deck made day two <laughs> you know what i mean so it would have been cool to make day two with this thing but like i said i'm still happy with how my run went overall but let's take a look at the actual fi final standings and what went on to actually win this event so taking a look at top eight here this is actually kind of a very unexpected top eight that we have uh you know night march won the entire event which in and of itself is crazy night march hasn't been super relevant and expanded lately but Jimmy did take this all the way to a finish here. He managed to beat two Trevenants in top eight and top four, which in and of itself is pretty impressive. Though I do remember, I believe in his top eight match, his opponent just got benched out two of the games. But nevertheless, he was able to navigate, I think, actually quite a hostile day two um, for Night March and make it all the way 
to win the tournament. So congrats to Jimmy Pendarvis to winning with Night March here. But taking a look at the rest of top eight, the, the big kind of anomaly here is we have a bunch of Trevenant. And Trevenant actually had a very good showing at this regional, which is really unexpected because Pikachu Zekrom was probably the most hyped deck going into this weekend, which should in most cases just annihilate Trevenant if they have even like a halfway decent first turn. But the reason I think Trevenant did so well is actually because of how hyped Pikachu Zekrom was. You know, a lot of the field was just a lot of counters to the deck. We saw a ton of fighting decks in a bunch of different forms. We had like Buzz Garb variants. We had the Hitmonchan Wobbuffet deck. We had Buzz Lucario decks. So there was a lot of hate for Pikachu Zekrom. And actually Trevenant does very well against those decks. So it was definitely a meta call that paid off very well for a few of these players. Like I said, we have four Trevenants making up half of the top eight decks here. And uh, taking a look at some of the other ones that we have, we have uh, Zorart Garboder making its way to top eight, not too unexpected. I think it's been one of the most solid, well-rounded decks we've had and expanded for a bit now. Uh, we had Archie's uh, Russell Parr taking that to, it uh, looks like a sixth place finish. And then we had a Mew like counterbox style deck as well, which is also kind of cool to see. So overall, this top eight is very different than I expected. I expected some fighting decks in here. You know, I think a Zorark deck was always kind of a safe assumption to see. Maybe a Picarom would have been expected. So uh, top eight definitely went very differently than I had anticipated here. But nevertheless, congrats to all these players on their finishes here. So overall, guys, I had a pretty decent weekend. You know, whipping day two by just a singular match is something I am no stranger to. That basically summed up uh, my past two seasons, actually, as just constantly making top 64 and whipping uh, day two. Um, you know, I've been doing pretty good this season. The few regionals I have attended, I've day twoed. Uh, but nevertheless, even though I didn't quite get there this time, still made top 64, which I'm pretty happy with. I do not regret my deck choice, one iota. I think Alone Executor is actually a really good deck. And I think for the expected metagame uh, that was anticipated to be seen, I think this deck was actually a really, really good play. Now, going forward, however, that could be a different story just because Trevenant is back on people's radars. And I think a lot of people are going to just look at these top eight results not understand why Trevenant did so well, just net deck these top eight lists and take them to, you know, maybe Greensboro Regionals, which is coming this weekend at the time of filming or maybe even different cups. And so Trevenant is definitely going to be a deck that's going to be back on the radar to some degree. Uh, with that in mind, I'm not sure if Alone Executor is going to be, you know, one of the better picks for Greensboro. Especially if people do just see Night March 1, I think that will actually encourage them to play Trevenant, which is actually another very bad match for Lowen Executor. Like I said, pretty much any control style deck, even Trevenant, which is more of a soft control deck since it's, it's still based around taking prizes, even something like that is still just super, super good against a Lowen Executor. You know, they play like four enhanced hammers normally in a lot of lists. Also, the spread damage is just too much to overcome. I think that actually hurts more than the item lock itself, just because your executes have 30 HP and they can just like de-evolve you after a single silent fear and uh, knock out all of your executors. So it's a just pretty terrible matchup. And for that reason, I'm not sure if a lone executor is going to be the best pick going into future expanded tournaments for this format. But nevertheless, like I said, for this particular event, I think a low executor is great. I don't regret my list whatsoever. Really happy with it. And overall, really enjoyed myself. Got to see a bunch of friends I don't normally see. Got to have some good food and got to, you know, just play a ton of Pokemon, man. But looking ahead to the future, I am going to be at Greensboro Regionals. Like I said, at the time of filming, that has not yet happened. It's going to be coming up this weekend. Um, I'm not sure what other regionals I'm going to just yet. I do plan on going to as many as I can. I just haven't committed to any others just yet, but I'll definitely be around. If you guys are going to Greensboro Regionals, definitely feel free to say hi if you run into me there. I met a lot of cool people in Toronto that watch the channel, so if you guys did run into me there, uh, you know, big shout out for coming up, saying hi, and, and being so friendly and supportive of this channel. But that's going to pretty much wrap up my tournament report, guys. Of course, as usual, feel free to like and subscribe and consider supporting this channel by becoming a patron over at patreon.com slash rarecandytcg or by picking up some merch from our online store at rarecandytcg.com. It would mean a lot. But as always, thanks for watching and we'll see you next time.